Being an outsider, you have done so much for Hindu caste and thereby you have contributed so much for India's caste also and you have given many wise guidance to India's social and political thinking also. What is it that made you to love India and Hindus so much? Ah. Well, actually, uh, I didn't love India at all. When I first came to India, it was circumstances. I didn't plan to come to India. You see, the year before that I'd had a chronic disease uh, which lasted for about a year. You know, it came up, then it went away, but then it, I thought it was over, but it came back again and so on. And so at long last it subsided. And I thought, well, you know, India means malaria and cholera and all these other terrible diseases. You know, why should I go to India? You see, a famous European uh, philosopher is called Immanuel Kant. He lived in uh, East Prussia, uh, a city that today is in Russia and is called Kaliningrad. And there are numerous philosophers studying Kant, and yet practically none of them have ever gone to Kaliningrad. You see, you can study Kantian philosophy without going to, you know, Kant's birthplace. And so, on that model, I thought, well, you can study the Upanishads and never go to Kurukshetra or to wherever they were written. And so, drop India. I mean, many of the 19th century Orientalists they did translations of Sanskrit writings and so on, but they never set foot in India. So I thought, you know, forget about India. And then uh, circumstances brought me to India anyway, and I enrolled in a BHU for some philosophy program. Uh, not very good, I must say, which was really directed to foreigners. You know, it was m mostly followed by uh, Koreans and so on, people who were in Varanasi for Buddhism. And um, so, yeah, yeah. And especially, you see, there, at the, I lost my interest in philosophy for a while. Later on, I took up Hindu philosophy in earnest. But you see, as a young fellow, you're not really, not really directed to philosophy, to philosophical interests. You know, you want action. And in India there was room for action. Because then I discovered the, the strange situation of um, secularism in India. You see, in Europe secularism means secularism. It means keeping a distance from religious matters. Whereas, whereas in uh, India, it turned out that Many secularist positions turned out to be pro-Islamic or even pro-Christian positions. In Europe, secularism had come about precisely as a reaction against Christianity. So this was strange. Like in the, in the affair of the uh, Satanic Verses, the novel by Salman Rushdie, uh, and it is in that context that my career as an Islam critic started. I found that uh, in India there was a big polemic going on among secularists whether to support this ban on the Rushdie book or not. And so the really hard secularists, the communists, they were in support of Rushdie. 
but all the, the Congress side secularists, like Khushwan Singh or like MJ Akbar, who today you might know as a BJP ideologue, but back then was in Congress, you see, they supported the ban. So I thought this was very strange. At that time, I thought, you see, that in Europe this was unthinkable. Now, of course, 30 years later, I know better, because in Europe now all our politicians are taking precisely the same positions. Like, just last week, there was this outbreak in France of a crisis around a girl, uh, a teenage girl, who um, apparently is lesbian, or at least was reputed to be lesbian, and so she was scolded by her Muslim brothers and friends and so on. And then she reacted to that on Twitter saying, l'Islam c'est de la merde. You know, Islam is, and then follows some word that I don't use in public. Um, and then she received death threats. And okay, you see, that is the usual pattern. But then what happened is that a number of leading politicians, including the justice minister of France, blamed her. And even, even had police investigate whether they could punish her for appeal to hatred or something, Islamophobia. Uh, so that's a new development. No, but that's, in India, that's old hat. Uh, you know, that's why you have Article 295A, uh, which prohibits, which was started as an article to prohibiting criticizing Islam, which was then later also used by Christianity and finally also by Hindus. But at any rate, it prohibits criticism of religion. So it is anti secular. It is as emphatically anti secular as you can get. So, you see, I discovered these things and I thought, my God, you see, let's do something about that. And so, then, um, then I met Sitaram Gowal, who, you know, helped greatly in making me understand what is really behind this situation. And so then I investigated the Ayodhya affair, which is at the source of the Ruzdi affair, um, as few people know. Um, and so then I got into that. I forgot about Hindu philosophy. Um, but so Hindu philosophy is great. And then later on, of course, I rediscovered it. But at that time, you see, it was current politics that interested me. And where I discovered many things that are just completely unknown in the outside world. In the outside, you see, uh, an India watcher who does not understand his own discipline at all, who is a complete failure, who is totally incompetent, is the one who says or who assumes that in India secularism means secularism. You see, there are all these people who write, yeah, the BJP is a threat to India's secular state. That presupposes that India is a secular state. That proves that you don't understand what secularism is at all. Because India is not a secular state, it discriminates against Hindus right from the constitution and into practical laws and policies. Um, secularist intellectuals are not secularist. You see, everything that they will violently condemn in Hinduism, they will condone in Islam or in Christianity. You know, in India, secular simply means anti-Hindu, you see. And, you know, Arab uh, mullahs and so on, they abhor the notion of secularism. To them, secularism means the completely sinful situation that men arrogate to themselves the right to make their own laws, whereas the authority to make laws rests in Allah, right? So they abhor secularism. Yet in India, they are all called secular, you know, they, they preach about secularism and so on. So the word secularism in India has a completely different meaning from its original meaning. And so if you don't understand that, and most India watchers don't, then it proves that you just don't understand India. Uh, so you see, when I saw that, I was fired up with zeal to correct that.
And so my first years were completely devoted to that. And so I wrote a study about the Hindu movement. I wrote my first papers about the Aryan invasion question also. And so that's also not philosophy, that's ancient history. Um, but so at that time, I was mostly about ancient and modern history of India. Uh, but so that was a complete change because I hadn't come to India to study India. I had come to India to study about Atman and Moksha and stuff. Uh, so for a while I, I was about India. But you see, later I saw, yeah, okay, India is interesting. But you know, any subject is interesting. Uh, it's only superficiality that is boring. But if you go deep into any subject, it becomes interesting. So in that sense, you see, India has greatly interested me. But ultimately, it's not India that I'm concerned with. You see, nowadays the RSS uh, is still, still, you know, weaseling around, you know, still in awe of secularism. Uh, so they say, yeah, you know, we don't care about Hinduism anymore, we care about Bharat, about nationalism, the nation, you know, and national integration and so on. Yeah, that's all very nice, but you see, uh, Head Gewar, who founded the RSS, or Shyam Prasad Mukherjee, who founded the Jansang, the earlier incarnation of the BJP, they were very much about serving Hindu interests. Today, Mohan Bhagwat says, and has said very repeatedly, it's not a one-time thing that is explainable by the context of a conversation. No, no, this is his viewpoint. Every Indian is a Hindu, right? Now, that is totally ridiculous. Is Asaduddin Owaisi a Hindu? Go ask him. You know, are you a Hindu? You know? Okay. Um, so, the, you know, Hedgevar or Mukherjee, they knew very well that Hindus have interests that differ from those of Indian Muslims or Indian Christians. And that the two words, Hindu and India, are not synonymous. So I'm all in favor of India. Like, for instance, I'm very much in favor of the integration of Kashmir with India, much better than the separation of Kashmir and the accession to Pakistan. Uh, so India is good, is important, as an instrument of Hindu civilization. And it is that what counts, not this, this territory India. There was a... a some yoga teacher who came to the West, he was from Jodhpur, Dr. Pukrat Sharma, actually a physicist, but who turned to yoga. And um, so, you know, many of these Westerners who are enamored of yoga, they often become enamored of India and of things India and Indian dress and everything Indian. And um, so they were asking him questions about India this, India that. And he interrupted them and he said, you see, India is not that important, you know. India will go. India is not Sanatana. Yoga, that's Sanatana. But India is not Sanatana. Forget about India. You see, India is important as an instrument for Hindu civilization. In that sense, I'm all for India. You should absolutely not ever uh, suspect me of turning against India. Oh, long live India. Akhan Bharat Amar Rahe, as uh, Savarkar used to say, uh, but nevertheless, it's not ultimately important. And so I was interested in Hindu philosophy, as I was at the time also very interested in Chinese philosophy. And so those countries, I didn't care. And um, so I, I landed in India, and then India started interesting me. In fact, I landed in India, and it was love at first sight. Though I also remember that <laughs> The first day when I arrived on Jampat, I was immediately fleeced of a big chunk of my money because I, I hadn't sort of figured out the system yet. Uh, so, I mean, I can say a few bad things about India, but I won't. I mean, they're not important. India, India is important in the sense that, you see, it's, it's the last bastion of, of pagan civilization whereas the rest of the world has been conquered by Christianity, Islam, or atheism. 
at the time the Soviet Union was still going strong, China was still having a repression against religion. Uh, so those three forces uh, were all over the place except in India. You see, India at that time, even, even under a Nehruvian government, you know, at least had enough of life in Hindu civilization. And that's, uh, that's a matter of hope for all mankind. That's very good. And so India should preserve Hindu civilization as a gift to the world, to mankind as a whole. Last question. Okay. You can go on asking last questions. I don't ask any better. Yes. 